Bon après-midi à toutes et tous. Good afternoon to all. It's already 2 p.m., so we like to start our events on time, so we'll start on time. Um, this session will be held in French, except from the last speaker who has decided to, to go back to English, as her slides are in English. Um, most of us are French natives, not French, but uh, francophone at least. Uh, um, and so we have interpreters that will be uh, interpreting this uh, conference uh, in, uh, uh, from both English and French. May I ask who doesn't speak French in this room? Ooh la la. <laughs> so please, use this for the first speakers. Uh, we have the interpreters with us. You can choose the, the, the English channel, um, and it works very well. But uh, Olena, who is with us, will be speaking in English at the end. So, donc je, je, je rep yes, here. Yes, no, don't worry. We are, can you hear? It's well? Okay. But if you, if you, if you don't speak French, yeah, yeah. So that's how it, there are two, uh, you, but you are right. There are two, il y a deux lignes vides. There are two rows that are free at the front of the room. So please don't hesitate to move a little closer to us. Don't be shy. There's plenty of space. Welcome. We're delighted to know that you're with us in the room or online, of course. Uh, this uh, conference is being recorded and is also live on our YouTube channel. So good afternoon. Thank you for joining us at the Geneva Health Forum for this session on the role of NGOs and non-governmental organizations in strengthening environmental health. I'm the one doing the slides, so here we go. This session is being filmed, as I mentioned, and is uh, streamed online on our YouTube uh, channel. It's also being recorded. For those who wish, you can watch it again on our website and also access the summary of the session. My name is Diana Rezilliol. I'm coordinator of the Réseau Environnement uh, Genève, Geneva Environment Network. It brings together all the players of international Geneva that work on environmental issues at a global level. The members of this network are obviously international organizations, other NGOs, but also uh, uh, academic uh, institutions, local authorities, and a few other entities. There are over 100 uh, institutions in Geneva that work on environmental issues at a global level. And obviously, we also work very closely with diplomats. We have over 180 countries represented in Geneva. So many, many things uh, are also done in partnership with many governments from Geneva on these matters. Our network is hosted by the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, and is financially supported by Switzerland. The headquarters of our network is not in Geneva, but in uh, Nairobi, in Kenya, but its uh, greatest presence outside of Kenya is here in Geneva. Why? Because here in Geneva, there's a large part of the United Nations system and all the players that I briefly mentioned in my introduction. What I should underscore with regard to Geneva, and you will be well aware of that because you're here at the Geneva Health Forum, is that in Geneva we have the WHO, the World Health Organization, and a fair number of organizations that are active in this field, which means that Geneva is the global center for health-related uh, issues, governance, and therefore everything that's related to environment and health, uh, Geneva is important too, which is why we work on this topic from Geneva. My specialty, you will have understood this, is environment and not health. And on this panel, we have uh, several members who work in the health field, and I'll be introducing them bit by bit as I give them the floor, as uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations keeps repeating and my colleagues for that matter, our planet is facing a triple crisis. The climate, lack of uh, loss of biodiversity and health. And these crises all have an impact on our health, which uh, 
is clear. There is gradual awareness, but solutions are late in being found. I would like to welcome the existence of uh, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, the headquarters of which is in Geneva, and the EPES, which is the uh, equivalent thing for uh, biodiversity, and the recent decision uh, made by the World Health Assembly to set up a panel of uh, scientific uh, experts for issues related to waste uh, pollution and uh, chemical waste. So for the th three crises I mentioned, we'll have scientific answers that will uh, enable us to take the measures necessary. experts provide us with the solutions for the uh, crisis that we're facing, the different scenarios. But we can see this with the IPCC that's been in existence over the 30 years. The governance measures uh, found to uh, have come the issues are too lengthy. Unfortunately, uh, actions need to be taken by the authorities to prevent these crises, which have major impacts on our health. We have communities that are mo getting mobilized uh, for the authorities to take action and uh, adopt the necessary regulations. The first person I'm going to be giving the floor to this afternoon is Andre Chikolela, who's seated to my left, the co-founder and chair of the Environment Health Network. Andre, you're a uh, chemistry expert toxicologist, researcher, and professor. And I'm sure I've forgotten a few of your titles, but I'll give you the floor first, and I'd like you to describe your experience as well as the context in which you set up the network that you are the leader of. Over to you. Well, thank you for your introduction. So I'll summarize all this in 15 slides. 15 slides for 15 years. If I had had 50 slides, I would have summarized 50 years because that's how long I've been working on this matter, pretty much. <laughs> it, it, it's good to ensure that people can be cured, but uh, it's also good to ensure that people don't fall sick. This is uh, the definition of health that I give when I give conferences. Everybody supports the idea. It's a very simple idea, and so it's not difficult to support it. Bit by bit, we are getting a more global uh, general vision of uh, the matter. Now, the, the network Environnement Santé was set up uh, some 13, 15 years ago. Further to uh, measures uh, and workshops that were organized in 2007 in France, all the NGOs that supported the idea were contacted to create this network and uh, promote environmental health. Given that I've, um, environmental health doesn't mean much to many people, we took an example of the mm, urgency of uh, policy in uh, uh, environmental health. The example was uh, bisphenol A, which uh, was uh, contained in most bottles used to feed their babies. Um, BPA was used in these bottles, started to be used a few decades ago uh, to replace glass bottles. The problem is that when you put BPA in the microwave, BPA comes out of the plastic and go, leaches into the milk, and a whole generation of babies were affected by this. So we were heard. Very swiftly, the local authorities uh, started to work on this matter. This was in March. In April, Paris withdrew uh, bottles containing BPA in uh, all nurseries, uh, and a year later, uh, BPA was banned from babies' bottles in the European Union. Uh, 
sorry, that was that was in France, and then in uh, November 2010, it was banned in the European Union. So now this decision has been implemented at European level. But then we explain this. We explain what follows to the members of parliament and of government, and we explain that yes, it's a good idea to protect babies. But before being babies, babies were fetuses, and uh, so we should uh, take that into account too. It was an urgent matter, and then we had a unanimous vote, which is very rare, a unanimous uh, vote of uh, members of parliament and ministers. Uh, in France. When we went to see one political group, uh, we had uh, a whole dossier uh, compiled and they said to us, no, don't worry, we understand what you're arguing in favour of, but do be aware that the opponents are here. And of course, it was the larger Petro uh, chemical companies, uh, oil companies that were present in the room. We launched another campaign that was successful this year, 2022. It was uh, the uh, uh, ban on a chemical product, uh, perchlorethylene, uh, which is used in uh, at the lawn at, at the lawners, and um, it's the most well-known smell that you smell when you uh, take uh, um, your clothes to the. Uh, Laundress, uh, it's unfortunately been it's it's fortunately been replaced by a water process. So we had data on cancers caused by this chemical product, which was in the water. Unfortunately, many of the uh, Laundry centers were throwing the chemical into the water systems and uh, it was in the sewers and then in the rivers and this has now been replaced by a virtuous circle. We explained to the members of parliament and uh, members of government uh, that there are many chemical products that affect human beings. We didn't want to have to adopt hundreds of different laws. And in 2014, we managed to get a law uh, adopted that was a global uh, ruling on endocrine disruptors without having to adopt hundreds of different uh, laws in the country. The second phase, 2019-2022, that was then. Now we're working on the third phase uh, of uh, our work on endocrine disruptors. Belgium hasn't uh, followed our example, which is unfortunate because we've had a fair amount of success. We adopted a charter of commitment for territories and cities uh, that live with no endocrine disruptors. One French citizen out of two lives now in a region that has signed this charter. In fact, we have a new region, uh, Normandie, which uh, said they would be signing very soon. Five regions, nine departments, and large cities, Paris, Strasbourg, Limoges, Bordeaux, Marseille, and small towns as well, uh, little communities of inhabitants that are also committing to this charter. Whatever the uh, political uh, type, left or right, of the regional departments. So it doesn't really matter what uh, uh, political group or belief uh, you have. I'm not saying that all uh, Green Party mayors have signed uh, or all socialists, for example, have not signed. It doesn't really matter what political group you belong to. There is no hard set rule. 
What we're doing here with this charter is sending a message, starting up a process. It's mainly a matter of restricting pesticides. The idea is to reduce uh, exposure to endocrine disruptors in uh, the food chain and preventing ultra-processed food from being contaminated because it's the actual processing of the food that uh, leads to the introduction of endocrine disruptors. The third axis is uh, promoting information for the population, health professionals, and the staff of the local authorities. So basically on TV, on radio, and online. The mayors actually say to me quite regularly when we go out, we uh, get into trouble and but here uh, people are saying that uh, they're very happy with what we're doing so the mayors themselves are delighted because they find that the populations are very favorable to these measures the fourth axis is setting up uh, environmental criteria by eliminating, progressively eliminating endocrine disruptors in all contracts and public procurement. The fifth axis is information on what's been done. So basically an overview of the measures taken on a yearly basis. Now there's a bit of greenwashing, obviously, but uh, globally there are local authorities that have uh, got uh, decided to get involved in this process and um, are being very active. So this is just to show that uh, it's a... Procedure. Sorry, I've just turned my microphone off, says the speaker. Then there is European recognition. The European Committee of Regions in 2019 asked the European Commission to uh, support initiatives such as ours, which is cities and territories with no endocrine disruptors and non has cities and basically the in 2020 the pa european parliament adopted a resolution on a similar matter basically asking the commission to create to support the creation of a european network of uh, cities and local authorities with no endocrine disruptors now uh, hot off the press is that last monday just to show you that things are uh, moving increasingly swiftly, the European Commission said elimination of 2,000 substances between now and 2030. So for somebody like me who's been following this for many years and decades, I have to say that the 25th of April is a date that will go down in history. We're not the only ones, uh, clearly, but uh, for a process that was launched in 2009, I have to say that we now have a lot of political support. And next week, I'm being being invi I've been invited to the conference on uh, chemical products, which is being held in Paris to raise the awareness of uh, the people and uh, uh, political leaders. We're also launching a new operation called, or initiative called Zero Phthalates, which uh, are included in uh, cosmetics, in foods, uh, ultra-processed foods, and plastic wrapping. If you go to eat at McDonald's uh, one evening and you have a, give a urine sample before going and one uh, the day after, you have 50% phthalates in addition to what you had before. Now, there are eight uh, childhood diseases. In fact, there are actually more now, but eight have been linked directly to exposure to phthalates during pregnancy. As this leads to consequences in both the children, grandchildren, 
and great-grandchildren. It has an impact on fertility, for example, over three generations, obesity, asthma, cognitive problems, language problems, hyperactivity, reproductive issues, <clears throat> all uh, affect uh, a large number of children. The initiative consists in either cutting uh, the person's hair and analyzing the phthalates in uh, the hair or asking the ambassadors who are volunteers to carry a bracelet, to wear a bracelet that catches uh, phthalates. So this makes pollution visible. We've been working with several departments The first phthalate that comes up is DEHP. It's banned, uh, but it's one of the ones that uh, who is mostly present. Why? Because it's present in PVC floors, which are forty percent phthalates. So they've been. It's been banned, yes, but nobody has uh, been to check these uh, floors. PVC flooring is used in uh, social housing. This uh, is closely linked to uh, speech problems, and uh, speech problems are, of course, uh, very present in uh, families with uh, social housing who use social housing. So this is uh, a very clear link. We worked. We work with uh, health insurances. And this gave us the following table. Speech problems can be seen in the first line. Having a table like this makes health professionals way more aware of the need to act and find the source of the problems. The last campaign, Awareness Raising Campaign, was organized in seven lycées. Here too, with these silicon bracelets, we organized several information sessions. It was extremely um, an extremely positive experience, especially with adolescents, who then went back and spoke to their parents. Last point, last action. We brought together the associations that so wished in uh, various groups, an inter-association uh, group for environmental health, we asked for the creation of an environmental health IPCC and this launched or led to the document that you have on the screen asking for an environmental health IPCC. Chemical products and food issues are closely related. We know that we're facing a food crisis, but we fear that the solutions found to this food crisis may lead to an increase in the health problems because of the use of processed foods. Yes, indeed, we have a series of negotiations present here in Geneva, planned in Geneva, and you will definitely be on the list of guests. And I have a series of questions that I would like to ask, but I will give uh, people the option to ask their questions before I do. Use the this. Um, donc, just une, uh, just une, une, une petite remarque sur le plastique. Uh, uh, just one small message. Uh, just very recently, at an assembly, the assembly at which the decision was made to create an IPCC for chemical products amongst others, and pollution, of course, 
We also took a decision, which was in all the media, on uh, plastic wrapping. So there's a there is negotiation that's going to be set up to try and eliminate plastics as much as possible from our lives because, of course, we do need plastic in our life to a certain extent. This is underway and there's a strong, there is strong mobilisation and NGOs here too play a very important role, uh, a role that is not always very visible but that certainly is significant. I now turn to Philippe Chamaret on my right. He's head of Eco-Citoyen pour la connaissance des pollutions. Dear Philippe, I would like you to tell us about your personal experience and the creation of the institute that you are the head of. Over to you. Thank you, Diana. And thank you, André, for the fascinating presentation you just made. I'm delighted to meet you all. Philippe Chamaret, I am head of the Institut, Institut Eco-Citoyen pour la connaissance des pollutions. So it's the Eco-Citizen Eco Institute for the Knowledge of Pollution. I got the necessary scientific and methodological knowledge necessary in my studies to understand what real scientists are talking about. So... I am a, a chemical expert, but I uh, worked on um, modeling on the environment and also came uh, across in uh, during my studies uh, many uh, politicians and uh, representatives of uh, various industries. Bit by bit, I got involved in the political aspect of the environment and I'm now head of the structure that you have on the screen. So what I'd like to explain to you uh, today is broken down in two parts. It's like a building. Uh, you start out with a problem. It's, it, it's like working on a problem, not like a building, sorry. So you start out with a problem and then you find the tool. Um, so on the one hand, you have the tool, and on the other, you have the knowledge, a whole set of uh, elements to know about and that I have to rely on in my daily work. So very briefly, to set the context, this is a city that's some 50 kilometers from Marseille in France. It's in an industrial area which is also a port. The whole area covers some 10,000 hectares. It uh, practically surfaced uh, overnight in the 1970s. 10,000 hectares were created to enable uh, for the largest industrial port to be created in France, if not in Europe. This was during uh, the period when in the 70s this is when uh, this is for France of course the TGV the fast train the Concorde and so on and so forth were created so many flourishing industries and to support the flourishing industry we needed uh, industrial sites including this one now FOSS which is this particular industrial site uh, uses heavy metals um, these industries emit they pollute intensively. And in addition to that, there's a diversity. So as you can see, I'm, I'm sorry, it's in French. I'm very sorry for the English speakers amongst you. But uh, you can see that we have steel. So that's in black. Uh, petrochemical uh, stuff, which is in red. Everything surrounding oil. Then we have... Um, a lot of logistics. That's in yellow. Uh, Transport, uh, road and sea. And more recently, uh, we've had uh, energy storing, for example, liquefied natural gas and waste management. So 
things have evolved. There has been an evolution, but also an increasing diversification of the industries present in this area. As a consequence, all of the emissions of pollutants, be it in the air, in the ground or in the waters, create exposure to pollutants for all people living close by, for Sumer, Port de Bourg, Martigues, amongst others. All of these, uh, all of the people living in these cities, there are four of them that you can see on the photo. So all of these citizens are exposed to the pollutants, um, a mixture of pollutants that they're not aware of, and the effects of which on health are unknown. Les années 70. So this uh, has been uh, going on since the 70s, but since then, Several questions were raised about the effect of these activities on our health, but uh, not that more, much more than that. The inhabitants uh, worked directly in those industries, so the relationship with those industries was a bit different, a little bit paternalistic, and uh, this is not um, a way to when people usually react. And in the 70s, a lot of people retired and there was a, a period of unemployment, which means that the inhabitants knew the industries, but they no longer worked in them. So it enabled them to really react and challenge uh, uh, those industries. Furthermore, the city of... Uh, Marseille uh, set up uh, its incinerator for waste management in Fosse sur Mer. So, everything that the inhabitants had been experiencing since uh, the 70s was uh, put forward. And, but the real trigger was uh, a demonstration against the incinerator where finally people started to wonder what were the effects of these industries on their health. And the surprise was that nobody knew. Nobody knew because uh, in the beginning of the year 2000, the knowledge to, uh, related to what was in the regulation. But uh, regulations exist to set limits that not necessarily are justified. Um, those limits come from standards that are based on what industrial operators can do. So between the rules and the limit and the reality on the ground, there is a huge gap, and this gap didn't make it possible to respond to the uh, people who demonstrated against this incinerator. And therefore, the elected officials seized the opportunity and uh, answered the request of the citizens by defining um, scientific policy for the territories, which means that the idea was to enhance knowledge. The policy's aim is to bring together, on the one hand, scientific knowledge, and on the other hand, the decisions that will be made afterwards. Because you can take any kind of decision, for example, modify. You cannot make a decision if you don't have um, prior knowledge on the topic. So this policy revolves around three principle, principles. First of all, knowledge needs to be integrated, which means that within the Institut Eco-Citoyen, which is the tool to implement this policy. Within our institute, we study 
the air, the the soil, uh, the water environment, and health. So we don't work in silos like we, what we can see in research. Because if you want to be specific on a topic, you need to work in silos. So there's a, a use to working in silos. Uh, silos can be useful, but oh, so, so when you when you focus on a topic, you can go really deep into a topic. So we need to have different structures in order to be able to bring together all these topics and to meet uh, political to meet political demands. So the three principles are here in front of you and make it possible to involve the citizens in this development of knowledge so as to identify the questions related to territories, what the problems are, and then enhance scientific knowledge. I'll stop here. I think it's been 10 minutes. Sorry, it's difficult to cut uh, you in the middle of your interventions. It's very difficult to stop uh, people who are so many who have so many things to share. So you talked about uh, pollution, but one thing that we haven't talked about uh, regarding global limits, there's a, a center in Stockholm which defined limits. And as regards pollution, we actually um, went beyond the limits, the limits that are safe for our planet. So we are well beyond those limits. This research was published just a few months ago. So there are a lot of things to do and it's very important for people to come together. I'll now give the floor to another activist, another heroine uh, of these issues, Malorie Guillon. She's uh, the spokesperson of uh, the Collectif Colère Pure Santé here in Geneva, uh, working on the quality of air. Of the air. And um, the Arve River is uh, often affected by pollution. So Mallory will uh, tell us more about the topic. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for inviting me. It was an honor for our uh, uh, association. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story about um, an association of women. I am a doctor. I am a general practitioner uh, next to Chamonix. And I am also a um, childhood doctor. I decided to work uh, in uh, environmental health and uh, air pollution. Because for me, it's uh, totally paradoxical that we that uh, we cannot breathe well in the mountains. Four years ago, air pollution was uh, a taboo in the Mont Blanc region. And I remember my colleagues telling me, please don't talk about it because we need tourists here. We cannot um, jeopardize local economy. And I was shocked at the time because I didn't know that there was pollution, air pollution in the mountains. And then I discovered that it was a real problem in the Arve Valley. So I thought about how I could act. And I um, thought I, I decided to act at the citizen level with the Colère Pure Santé, at the medical level with the Collectif Environnement Santé 74, and at the national level. 
So why did I decide to work in this uh, field? Look at the look at the image here. There are several sources of pollution: uh, road traffic, truck traffic, uh, different uh, type of plants, incinerators. We uh, have the problem of um, uh, heating with the wood in the winter. And uh, as I said, I live in a, a town called Passy. And this is the most polluted uh, city in France. Every year, we are subject to pollution uh, peaks. Uh, more than five or more than 20, uh, 40 days of uh, pollution peaks. I'm uh, the mother of three children, and one of my children had to go to hospital for 18 months uh, because he had a um, bronchitis. And at the time, I didn't understand why people asked me if I was a smoker. I said, no, of course not. And then I discovered that uh, the air was polluted. In 2017, the people demonstrated together because we had days and days of uh, um, pollution alerts. Um, a doctor had uh, had uh, warned uh, people of uh, what was happening and. Uh, People accused him of uh, lying, and then demonstrations were organized, and uh, the elected uh, officials had to react. This gave us hope, and uh, th this uh, very doctor I told you about uh, was going to be an MP, but this didn't work. In uh, 2017, there was a study, the Equis study relating to 85 premature deaths in the Arve Valley. So uh, the main reason uh, for what I'm doing is uh, because children are sick. I see different uh, type of uh, bronchitis um, for uh, kids and uh, older people, new types of uh, asthma. And what I what, what struck me as uh, not normal is that uh, I, I noticed that these different forms of asthmas uh, appeared outside of winter, for example, in summer, in the summer, in the fall. And this struck, struck me as uh, not being normal. Uh, so here you see the demonstrations of uh, people and uh, drawings made by children. And um, here I'll tackle uh, what I really want to address. So there was some kind of inertia. We were four women and we met during a march, uh, during a demonstration. And we decided to uh, organize um, uh, an organization, an association. Everybody is free to come whenever they want to share their specialties and their expertise in order to um, make sure that um, this problem um, is uh, solved. The a study was published, an environmental study was published, which showed that there was uh, abnormal uh, rates of uh, heavy metals in uh, a zone in Passy, where I live, and this created a scandal. The elected officials were upset that we had published without telling them uh, that we had published these uh, very uh, worrying results. So. We said we were uh, an association uh, and uh, because we wanted to make sure 
that uh, uh, the health of our children would be uh, protected. I'm going to tell you a bit more about what we do. We have wanted to work uh, on different levels. We organize several types of analysis, environmental analysis uh, regarding uh, dust, air, um, eggs, mushrooms, etc. And uh, we realized that there were abnormal uh, levels of um, endocrine disruptors. We also um, brought uh, people to justice. We um, filed 540 complaints and uh, started uh, several proceedings. And we are now in uh, the stage of appeal. And after all these actions, I decided to organize a campaign, campaign to um, take uh, samples of hair on people to um, find possible heavy metals. And unfortunately, we, we had a lot of um, negative results. So... We are continuing, we continue, we continue to uh, talk about everything that is not normal in our environment and uh, on everything that has an impact on the health of uh, children and um, people in general. So here you can see uh, uh, we are at the administrative tribunal. Um, of course, we organized several demonstrations on the sector of the Pays du Mont Blanc, but also in Switzerland. We also do a lot of things on the social uh, network, and we had a lot of requests by uh, the media. And uh, there's also a documentary movie where we talk about our initiatives, we talk about the problems, but we are also here to propose practical solutions to the populations. So we created um, a recycling center uh, in the Mont Blanc region, and we are doing a few things that um, are important for the people and which uh, encourage people to take part and uh, we want to say that we we are acting we are uh, we want to show we want to be an example and this is what's going to help policies to uh, follow and we were lucky enough to work with other associations one local association called the association for quality of life in Passy and this uh, made it possible for us to um, gather different indicators and to meet uh, elected officials. We also uh, initiated the creation of a medical association, which made it possible to train uh, health professionals and to inform the population, but also to bring forward strong arguments uh, for policies to be put in place, uh, policies for our health and for the environment. This, what you see here, was the first Congress on air pollution for health professionals. It took place in June in ANSI, and on the national uh, level, we are lucky enough to be able to exchange with the Réseau Environnement Santé with André Chicolela and also to take part in the CC Association, which make it possible to um, talk to the um, to the people concerned, to organize conferences. Um, we also uh, participated in the Grenoble call for an IPCC for environmental health. 
as well as to um, bring political decision in favor of a healthy planet. Our last project is the creation of the Eco-Citizen Institute for the Mont Blanc region. We are honored to be able to set up this project to study uh, different pollutants, water, air, soil, and their impact on environment and health. And um, now we have figures on uh, cancers, on uh, cardiovascular diseases, and this will help uh, to influence local officials and make the right decisions because we are in a valley where there are a lot of pollutants and I hope that this uh, initiative will make it possible uh, to say that we live in a, in a, in a critical uh, place and uh, I hope this will also lead to new regulations on the European level. So this is our hope. Here you can see the picture with uh, Philippe Chamaret, who had uh, welcomed our colleagues, uh, the launch of our institute. And to conclude, uh, we need to bring together the citizens. We are all heroes. We are not the only heroes. You are heroes too. You can change the world. You can change uh, our environment and health. So there are things to do. Everybody is specialized in one way or another. You just need to start doing something. And in four years, we were able to make sure that this topic of air pollution is no longer a taboo. Now, people talk about it. They ask questions. Uh, for example, they ask questions to me when they come uh, for a medical visit. And uh, people take part in the different events that we organize. It's a health emergency for our children, for our mountains. It's a public health stake. And it's only if uh, citizens ask, uh, act and uh, lobby that we'll be able to change things. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup pour... Thank you very much for this very moving uh, presentation. The first conference on uh, air pollution uh, happened only in uh, 2018 and air pollution kills 7 million of people per year. We all want to have questions, but uh, I'm now going to give the floor to uh, Sonia Hediger, who is also a doctor and who is a member of uh, Extinction, for Extinction, uh, Extinction Rebellion. Sonia, you're based in Switzerland, not far from Geneva, and you're an activist, uh, environmental activist. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I would like to talk about in Extinction Rebellion and the doctors for Extinction Rebellion. It's a bit different from what was addressed uh, uh, before me. You might have heard about Extinction Rebellion. This movement uh, started uh, in 2018 in uh, England and uh, the movement reach, reached Switzerland early 2019. This was our uh, declaration of rebellion. Our movement has three uh, very simple uh, claims. First of all, the first one I, f I forgot. <laughs> the first one is to declare a climate emergency. The uh, declaration of uh, a climate emergency was the first uh, request uh, that was made in several cities, if, several countries, but it hasn't been really efficient. Um, the objective was to declare a climate emergency and uh, we wanted the elected officials to talk to the media to really inform uh, the population. Uh, it's still difficult to, to uh, talk to the media. Second point, uh, zero CO2 emissions by 2025. Everybody say that we are extremists, but it's 2025 is already 
way too late. 2025 20, is now, and we need to stop now. And we do not have any clear proposals as to how we're going to do this, but our pro proposal is to set up citizen as assemblies of citizens, as it was made in France, um, but assemblies who can decide. We want uh, citizens to be able to decide for themselves. From the beginning, we were supported by um, uh, different people. Our movement um, is based on our principles and our values. Our main idea is to take care of ourselves in order to take care of other people and to take care of the planet. So it's a real shift. It's a real paradigm shift. And our values help us make decisions on the way we're going to act. What we chose to, to be able to achieve our aims is civil disobedience. This worked very well because it started with a small group and we managed to uh, get the attention of the media through civil disobedience. When we started in 2019, we were considered as terrorists. And uh, more and more, we are noticing that uh, we are being invited. For example, here, people and um, uh, politicians realize that uh, people like us are needed, uh, people who demonstrate, who are a bit extreme, but who want to tell the truth. And we never use violence. It can be considered as a certain type of violence by people who are, um, and for example, uh, stuck in their cars, but uh, it's really a non-violent movement. So this was one of the big demonstrations uh, in Lausanne. These uh, demonstrations are always uh, full of joy. The atmosphere is an atmosphere of joy. We want to show that uh, there can be a different way of living together, of interacting and of taking care of each other. And Doctors for Extinction Rebellion started working together at the end of 2019. We realized within our group that uh, we were several uh, uh, healthcare uh, workers, uh, not only doctors, but uh, all every all of the people who work in uh, healthcare and who who um, cure people, whether it is for physical health or mental health or alternative medicine. So it brings together different type of, of um, healthcare workers. So this is what you see here shows uh, how we have to deal with uh, the police uh, quite often. And uh, it shows that we are here to warn people about what's happening. This is the flyer of uh, Doctors for XR. The QR code is no longer valid, I'm sorry. Can I continue? Okay. So we met with several people, and the first thing we did was to organize a conference uh, at the Shiv uh, Hospital in Lausanne. And so, so the Shiv is the 
Cantonal Hospital of uh, the Canton de Vaux. So we met there and uh, we had uh, quality speakers who talked about the situation and of the need to uh, commit. There were several uh, doctors present and uh, doctors for extinction Re rebellion. Uh, so we were here uh, for the first time, we were there for the first time um, publicly. This conference made it possible for us to reach quite a lot of people and several days later a, a big action took place in Lausanne with about 60 healthcare professionals who agreed to disobey because this demonstration was not authorized. So these people went down in the street to uh, denounce the inaction of the government. So here, this is me. We also uh, took uh, part in uh, the different various uh, climate demonstrations and marches. We would like the population and the elected officials to realize that there's a close uh, link between uh, destruction of the environment, pollution and health. And uh, currently this link is not really being uh, made. If I showed this to you, it's to show that it is very, very difficult to have the attention of the media. And uh, we have the feeling that we all need, always need to do more uh, for them, for the media to write anything about uh, uh, our topic. So this action was called, uh, we don't want to go back to normalcy. And this took uh, place at the end of the um, confinement in uh, the Canton de Vaux. Uh, we were there in Yverdon and uh, we brought a lot of empty shoes to ask them to not to go back to normalcy. This was the, our first action. Uh, the Dr. Soixer uh, 4XR, which was carried out in Lausanne. We were delighted and surprised to see that we had quite a number of professors amongst us who joined our forces, the former cantonal doctor of the canton of Vaux, uh, nevertheless right wing, but he felt that it was his duty to lie down with us on this square because he too feels this climate and environmental urgency. The strongest action carried out was here in Geneva before uh, in front of the WHO headquarters. We asked to meet the Director General, Dr. Tedros, so we came together on the Place des Nations We were in front of the WHO where we were welcomed by Dr. Tedros. This was during the World Health Assembly and we had a message to give him for all health ministers of the world who'd come together in Geneva virtually given the COVID pandemic. And Dr. Tedros told us well, he didn't tell us. He actually welcomed us very warmly and said that he was one of us. He left with a badge. And indeed, a few days later, at the closing ceremony of the World Health Assembly, he presented our letter with our requests, which are weaker, weaker, which are requests to 
slow down technology, to foster prevention rather than cure, to search for the causes of diseases and not just run behind them. But for this major action where, or protest where over 200 uh, health professionals uh, took part, there was just one small article, uh, not a single full article in uh, the Swiss media, even though it was talked about globally. We did the same thing uh, just before COP26 for Alain Berset. We asked him, so this is... The uh, federal councillor, the, it's the, basically the health minister, for those of you who don't know him, uh, Switzerland. Unfortunately, Alain Berset, the Swiss health minister, has told us that everything has been done to do what needs to be done and that he cannot do any more than that. So we really do need citizen assemblies. So there we go. Just to conclude, I'd like to say... that our movement uh, continues to work with a whole host of other uh, entities, networking, we work with uh, political entities too. We will continue to be out there in the street because it's absolutely vital. And we also uh, would like to let you know that many of us are politically committed, but also in terms of resilience in another uh, vision of a health system. We would like uh, health centers to be focused, more focused on prevention than on cure and also ensure that uh, the people themselves are aware of how to take care of themselves and of the planet simultaneously. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonia, for sharing this with us. And I now turn to the last speaker of this panel, not of the European continent, Elena Zotova. She comes from Quebec. She's the chair of the Réseau d'Action pour la Santé Durable au, au Québec. Elena, over to you. Elena will be speaking in English. Thank you so much. Um, Delighted to be taking part in this uh, discussion. My name is Olena, and to introduce myself. <laughs> uh, yes, so my name is Olena. I trained as a medical doctor at McGill University uh, in Canada, in Quebec. Uh, but uh, as we face a climate emergency, I decided to uh, shift away from clinical practice and not engage in residency, which is an unconventional choice, because I felt ethically compelled to act, um, really to put my energy where I felt it was the most uh, needed for the sake of uh, current and future generations. So originally, I'm actually from uh, Ukraine as well. So I, I have a strong sensibility to uh, inequities and uh, um, injustices uh, overall, probably which motivated my, my involvement in the climate and health uh, uh, movement. So today I wanted to uh, give you a general overview of an, an action network that we have built in Quebec and actually building on some of the narratives that uh, the panels have uh, presented today, which I, f I find are very inspiring. So I'm here to give you maybe a little bit more of a structural overview of how we can manage to mobilize communities in these kinds of projects that, that were presented to you today. Our initiative is called in French Le Réseau d'Action pour la Santé Durable du Québec, which translates as the Action Network for Sustainable Health in Quebec. Just a few disclosures before, I'm, I'm sponsored by the Association pour la Santé Publique du Québec, so the Quebec Public Health Association, and also from the um, International Ministry of... Uh, from also by the Quebec Ministry for International uh, Relations. And... Um, Really, the association, the Quebec Public Health Association, they work on a variety of, of levels uh, with a mission to uh, work towards uh, sustainable health. And our action network is one of the many projects that they have under their umbrella. So I just wanted to present this to you today. 
Now, the action network that we have been building over the last two years is really based on a few premises that have been proven by literature, how healthcare professionals are trusted voices in communities, how we are able to leverage human narratives based on, on our own experiences in the clinical field, but also on our patients' stories and on the stories that we see with our fellow community members, just like the ones that we have listened to uh, today. And also, what we really value is interdisciplinary leadership. So it's not only about doctors mobilizing in the fight against climate change or for sustainable health. It's really about mobilizing across disciplines in the healthcare sector in order to uh, distribute that leadership and for each person to find their role and their place in that movement. So what are we aiming for with this action network? Our mission is to safeguard sustainable health in a healthy environment in Quebec. The general objective that we have given ourselves is to mobilize healthcare and social services stakeholders in Quebec sustainably and strategically in order to achieve sustainable health in Quebec. And more specifically, how we're, we're putting this uh, in, in the works, but putting this in practice, is by facilitating multi-stakeholder consultation collaboration, sharing resources, experiences, creating trainings, uh, education materials, and also fostering distributed leadership and social accountability across a variety of healthcare professionals. Who are we currently? So we have done the official launch actually in March, at the end of March. And uh, we have united 20 organizations in the healthcare and social services sector in Quebec, uniting nearly 150,000 people who work or study in the healthcare sector in Quebec, which is actually not far from 50% of healthcare uh, workers and, and, and students in the province. And we are uh, aspiring to um, uh, mobilize even more associations, associations and organizations moving forward, inspired by similar um, action networks and coalitions and alliances that have been launched all over the world, such as the Climate and Health Alliance in Australia, the uh, UK Health and Climate Change uh, um, Alliance, and, and many, many others others. Now, what inspires us? Why are we building this action network? There's a framework that has been put forth by the WHO uh, since the, the late 90s, um, led, uh, spearheaded by a medical, uh, by a doctor uh, called uh, Charles Bolin. And this is the social accountability framework created originally for education institutions with a famous Pentagon that you have now uh, on the screen, um, emphasizing the need to connect health professionals, academic institutions, communities, health administrators, and policymakers, and to cre really create a platform that will allow people to communicate their needs, to collaborate, um, and, and, and to share, in order to co-construct together a health system based on people's needs. This is a framework that is really inspiring us to involve a variety of actors in such an action network, and among the 20 organizations that are part of our action network, we currently have representatives of health professionals, so professional associations, labor unions, student associations. We also have academic institutions, faculties of medicine and health sciences, as well as some research consortiums. We also have some communities who are um, involved, so civil society groups, environmental groups and, and associations, community-based NGOs, and, and overall general public, um, pe people from the general public who engage with us. And we're also in, in engaging more and more some of the management structures in our healthcare establishments, including people from the health ministry, although they are not officially members of, of the Action Network, they still gravitate around, around the, uh, the Action Network. And of course, engaging policymakers, I, I, I put them in gray just because it, we're not able to rally them within the action network necessarily, but they are crucial actors that, that we have managed to, to uh, find, um, to, to build allyship with. Uh, several deputies, several government affiliated institutions su such as public health uh, institutes that are officially um, under the, the Ministry of Health as well as health and environment ministries, which we are developing some ties with in order to be able to communicate to them more directly. So what are we working on specifically bringing all of those actors together? We have a common agenda that is um, elaborated within a charter for sustainable health in Quebec uh, along three major pillars so, or, or axes. The first one is limiting climate change. And we have five demands that um, include elements such as divesting from fossil fuels, um, limiting um, 
fossil fuel extraction projects and overall reducing greenhouse gas uh, emissions to, to net zero as fast as possible. The second pillar is the supporting sustainable communities. This is about using the healthcare perspective to support environmental action in community, uh, citizen-led projects such as greening, health, uh, healthy transportation, public transportation, fighting air pollution and, and many other initiatives. And finally, the third pillar is leveraging a sustainable health system because as we know, the healthcare system is responsible for nearly 5% of emissions uh, in, in Canada. And we have four demands that, which include uh, reaching a carbon neutral healthcare system in Quebec. How do we collaborate around this agenda? We have a shared governance of a round table of member organizations, which are those uh, professional associations, labor unions, and, and faculties of medicine, and other organizations that I presented to you earlier. And we have created participatory structures um, that allow exchanges, that, that allow co-creation between the actors who are involved, including consultations with community members and, and uh, community uh, representatives, uh, interdisciplinary committees working on some key themes that we have identified, collaborative projects that we um, rally around, and we perform joint advocacy projects as well uh, with communities. What have we achieved so far? Just um, a, a little list of, of some of the actions that we have uh, undertaken, including a petition for a carbon neutral healthcare system in Quebec, which we uh, brought to the National Assembly, which is where our deputies meet and, and, and take political decisions. We have published uh, several op-eds, reports, uh, media appearances, uh, online campaigns, and, and, and done other actions to really put health arguments forward in support of citizen-led environmental initiatives. And uh, we have also built some capacity building uh, trainings. We have grown many, many collaborations across the healthcare sector and across environmental sectors, trying to break those silos that, those silos that exist uh, across disciplines and creating a platform that will, would allow to break those silos in practice. And finally, raising the ambition of the healthcare sector. So by generating a movement, we're actually able to um, achieve endorsement by usually more conservative institutions such as faculties of medicine or uh, other professional associations. Now, it's all about improving and, and trying to uh, generate social change, and there are best practices that are discussed in the literature uh, in this regard, so we're always trying to learn from other experiences in social movement building. And there's a model that was um, developed by uh, Kenny and Kramer and published in the Stanford Innovation Review that's called the Collective Impact, and it's based on five keys uh, that are essential to solve complex problems, which we are striving for but are, are not there yet. Uh, the first key is a common agenda, which you, you might have seen that, that we already have, a shared measurement system, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and a backbone bone support organization that will allow people not only to be involved as volunteers, but really that would support the, the movement and give us a, a, a strong backbone to work with. So this is kind of where we stand. We're, we still have to develop those shared measurement systems. We can still improve on our mutually reinforcing activities and continuous communication, uh, also because we are, we are just uh, uh, emerging as, as an action network in Quebec. Looking ahead, uh, there are a few challenges that we need to tackle, such as limited resources and funding. Um, we're currently awaiting for several uh, uh, funding uh, uh, answers. Engaging policymakers and institutions more sustainably, and this is really work in progress, but I think that looking ahead uh, with continuous efforts and, and following the collective impact model, this is, is very promising. And a few thoughts about funding. In the collective impact model, it is recognized that we need more funding for collective initiatives, right? So not only initiatives that focus on super specialized research or uh, individual singled out initiatives, what we really need is using the analogy of a forest, we need to fund the forest, not only the trees in the forest. So we really need to fund those community collaborations and, and those ties that are between organizations and not only specific solutions that are called innovations in the in the nonprofit sector right and by shifting funding in in this way we can better support those initiatives that have the potential and the power to create social change and create more sustainable structures uh, for our societies so I encourage you to connect with us. Uh, you have our website uh, on the screen, and uh, we will be happy to answer your emails and, and hear your experiences as well. And I'm looking forward to the discussion as well to learn from um, other panelists' uh, experiences. Thank you very much.
Merci, Merci beaucoup. Euh... Thank you so much. I think we can start the question and answer session. I'm sorry if you saw me a little concerned, but we have a few issues with the live session. You had a question. You raised your hand earlier on. Do you still have the question? When you take the floor, please introduce yourself. Please press the little button so that the interpreters can hear you and translate. Sir, you have the floor. Please press the button. Great. Rafi Derbad. I represent an organization called Terre des Hommes Schweiz, based in Basel, and I work mainly with organizations that work with communities in southern Africa. My question is related to the first three presentations in particular, where I got the impression that it wasn't large urban areas that were mobilized. My question is, how do we mobilize communities? All of the presentations were very clear and extremely interesting from the point of view of NGOs, structures, and the work carried out on a daily basis. But what I would be interested in is knowing what challenges are there, what strategies are there to mobilize the communities as such. We always speak about heroes and citizens, but on the uh, photos I see many female heroes, heroines, and citizens, female citizens, and we, we often uh, speak about fairly patriarchal structures, so I'd like to know how to mobilize in all of the communities. And then the images that I saw, is that the wrong image? I see many more women, uh, active women, uh, on the defense, and maybe I'm not correct, but I see far fewer women in the decisions. And this is something that I see not only in Switzerland, but globally. So those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Are there any uh, similar questions? So you are not the French speaker. No, not. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, everyone, for the very interesting uh, discussions. Uh, so my name is Ola McFadden. I'm from Frontline AIDS, which is a, a global network of HIV community and NGO organizations. Um, so this question is mainly for the Geneva Environmental Network, but also any of the other panelists can answer as well if they're, if they're interested. Um, so the title of the event in English is um, Nothing Will Happen Without Communities and the Role of NGOs. Um, the, the promotional poster and some of the photos in the opening part of the presentation were of people and communities in the Global South, but I think all of the NGOs which are represented on the panel were based in upper income countries in the Global North. So I think, you know, communities in the Global South are some of the most vulnerable to environmental degradation and the, the community organizations there, they play a very big role in responding to environmental crises. So if, as the title says, if nothing will happen without communities, then it would be important for community representatives from the larger part of the, the world to be involved in these discussions as well. And I think the event description also mentioned using HIV activists as a potential model. And one of the slogans we have in the HIV movement is nothing about us without us or nothing for us without us. So going forward, is there ways that your network or your other organizations as well can work to include communities from the Global South in these discussions and in the wider conversations around community engagement, community leadership on this very important topic? Thank you very much. I'll quickly answer that question before giving the floor to Andre and the other panelists. made of many people who are, we have some people who come from the south, but the majority of the people who are in person here, uh, also because of the COVID situation, is still from the global north. So when the, 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 the secretariat of the forum was setting up the, the panel, it's true that it was people, they are also encouraging in person, uh, you, you saw that most of the panels people are here in person. So this is why you end up with a panel from people who are more from the global north because they are the ones physically here. But it's true that the way we engage within the international community in Geneva, we also we always make sure not only that we have gender balance uh, uh, panels, but also that we include people from uh, all the regions uh, on, on the work we do. And indeed, uh, uh, there are a lot of communities in the global south that are certainly relevant in these discussions. And when we do things with about plastic, pollution, and other topics that I have mentioned in the introduction, we 
we make sure that we have uh, 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 either governments, either uh, civil society organizations that do represent uh, these. Uh, these um. But I will let the other colleagues uh, reply, but we will start by replying to the other questions. And I give the floor to André, who, uh, given that he, you were uh, questioned directly, yes, I'll answer your question. I think that here it's a matter of understanding the link between the environment and health. Traditionally, and this is normal, we moved from targeted pollution, visible pollution. Initially, it was the pollution created by factories that was visible. You saw it coming out of the uh, chimneys. But there's other pollution that is invisible, phthalate pollution, bisphenol pollution. It's supposed to be at zero, but we're contaminated on a daily basis. So we need to make invisible pollution visible, and that's the NGOs who need to work on that. Now there's a campaign uh, that consists in uh, wearing a silicon bracelet. People are very surprised. Uh, it makes you feel that you are in a secondary school, but it uh, captures the pollution and sends an image. And when you do that with health professionals, it's really interesting. The health professionals feel that they're not concerned. They think that it's the others that are concerned, the ones that they have in front of them, not themselves. And when you focus on childhood diseases, uh, it's uh, diseases that affect everybody, not only those who live in cities, but also those who live in the countryside. Contamination comes from the outside, but it contam contaminates you inside. And what we really underestimated was the indoor contamination, uh, contamination from these endocrine disruptors. And it's all fairly recent. Uh, the awareness of the effects on several generations is not yet done. People are not yet aware of that. Where does this contamination come from indoors? Well, it's our relation to PVC, to plastics, to perfluorides, uh, to antiadhesives, all flame retardants. We're currently working on nurseries. Uh, nurseries are where you are extremely cautious, but nurseries are 50 times more contaminated by flame retardants than normal housing. So that's great. You want to avoid fires, and so you contaminate those who live and work in nurseries. Flame retardants are used in pillows, in pillows, I ask you. And then you have uh, newborn babies that suck their pillows. So we try to be cautious and yet we are creating more sources of pollution. Take asthma. Asthma is a huge problem. One child out of ten. Asthma, external outdoor pollution. Yes, but what about indoor pollution? If you have uh, PVC flooring. 3,200 children took part in a study over 10 years. One figure. PVC flooring in the parents' room, not in the children's room, in the parents' bedroom. Asthma is multiplied by two. You remove the PVC flooring in the parents' room and you divide asthma by two. No drug is going to give you that kind of result. That's without talking about other childhood diseases. It's a win-win situation. But you've got to keep acting, and you uh, have different types of acting. When the European Commission says we'll ban PVC flooring by 2030, well, that's considerable change, changes. PVC flooring is 40% phthalates that contaminate the entire indoor environment and the entire ecosystem. You find phthalates on ants in the Amazon. Now, I'm not going to get lost in this. I have a lot to say. Health of human beings, health of the ecosystem. You see, the two are joined. But yes, communities, small rural communities are affected in the same way, maybe even more. You have uh, agricultural contamination, pesticides. It's mainly endocrine disruptors. You have other type of pesticides. If you put uh, tick repellents on your cats, this is an endocrine disruptor. So <laughs> we've got to get out of this vicious circle. 
Yes, I fully follow you and, and support what you're saying, but that wasn't my question. My question was about mobilization of communities and how you go about it. So could you answer that question? I'd really like to focus on communities and especially rural communities. I see fewer challenges for the urban areas. I see greater challenges for rural areas. In the signatories, there's the uh, community of Saint-Omer with 50 commune. I signed with the chair who was the mayor of a commune of 200 inhabitants. So local authorities truly are the place where there is the greatest, greatest awareness because uh, the representatives are, the political representatives are closer to the inhabitants, to the people. Changes do take place there, whereas changing flooring in nurses depends on the town hall. Uh, you don't need to wait for a regulation from Paris or from Europe. You can take action at the local level. Now, we're a little late, but I would like to give the floor to all the speakers. I'll move to my right here and then over to the left. Uh, <coughs> yes, so for communities and for the involvement of people regarding these questions, we used two systems. One integrated the associations uh, for the defense of the environment who worked on conflicts. And the involvement really um, works uh, regarding uh, conflicts. Um, we didn't have all the citizens uh, with us. So how can you actually involve and, and how can you account for the demand and for the needs of people? Our institute chose to include uh, um, um, participation aspect, meaning that we involve everybody with their knowledge. We involve them in the research process. So we have on the one hand the conflict and uh, the response to the conflict to see what creates a conflict. That's one uh, consequence. And the other one is the use of the environment. So we don't, uh, we're not based in a big city. We are based in an industrial zone, even a little bit rural, where people uh, have a strong link with the territory, with uh, what we call identity and environmental conflicts. And this is what makes it possible for us to um, respond to their needs and to their, to their fears. Marjorie, can you respond? Yes, you talked about uh, mobilizing communities. You also addressed uh, the question of uh, hearing, heroines and heroes. Um, for us, mobilization took place in a mountain community which uh, lives of uh, tourism and economy. And it was uh, really difficult to uh, make things move. But what really made a change was that we were only women and we were so concerned about our kids that we were ready to move mountains. Uh, and we were ready to go as far as possible. That's why we brought, uh, brought this uh, before the justice and system. And then uh, the media followed. And uh, the elected officials at first said we were hysterical. They said uh, that uh, we were totally exaggerating and that, uh, that uh, it couldn't last. But I think that when we feel particularly uh, concerned because of our kids, it, 
it, it really helps. And the, the biggest leverage is the media. If you want to move things, it's something that can be scary, but it's a huge leverage. And this is what helped um, make things uh, move in the Arve Valley. Um, when people realized that uh, things were being told on TV, it meant that there was a real problem. And there was a, a success um, because of uh, the media attention. But then you need to bring evidence. You need to have a scientific uh, discourse, which validates our uh, our um, work so there are quite a number of aspects that need to be uh, to work together for a real change to happen i'll give the floor to sonia to <clears throat> respond to the question about mobilization and uh, <laughs> HIV it was about uh, why why are we not doing the same thing about climate than was done about HIV? Okay, okay. So, for example, XR is is really international, and uh, XR UK has developed loads of tools uh, to to mobilize. And they are shared uh, really worldwide. There are some uh, XR India, XR uh, South Africa, XR Nigeria. There are really uh, branches all over the world that get help from the global north as well to, to uh, share information. How do we do? How do we mobilize? How, how is it all done? And uh, so... On, on the side of XR, we we do take care of of the global south. Does this answer something? <laughs> I forgot that uh, we had interpreters. Uh, we I forgot that uh, the interpreters were here and that they had other meetings. So I suggest that we continue our discussions. But uh, before that, I would like to give 30 seconds to each speakers, uh, to each speaker, because because I I understand that the discussion isn't uh, finished yet. But I would like to give 30 seconds to each speaker uh, for them to to tell us what what's m most important for them. So we will start uh, in the same order. Uh, in which we started. So I'll give the floor to André, 30 seconds. I, I'm very, I'm very short, very brief. Two words to sum up uh, my way of seeing things. Optimism and measure. Optimism, because we have a major problem in front of us, the health crisis. And when uh, you realize that we have this problem, uh, well, you realize it's terrible that you, we should have started earlier, but when you actually realize that this is happening now, you can act and you can do something. We need to bring the population together, reduce uh, language uh, problems uh, as early as two years old is something that's possible. The Stockholm conference took place 50 years ago, and it brought together NGOs and civil society uh, actors. But pollution was already on the agenda uh, 50 years ago in Stockholm. But things things were put in place since then, but not enough. Um, I turn towards Philip for his final message. 30 seconds. Well, what I would like to, what I would like you to remember from my presentation is that it is necessary to bring an adapted and specific knowledge to the decision makers. I think this is the most essential point uh, for any change.
all, all the studies that are made uh, will help decision makers uh, make decisions that lead to change. There are a lot of things that can be done, but I think that it is possible to do them. And it, and it has been done in Fossumer, sur mer. I would like to reiterate that you are all heroes. You can all act at your own level, do something. Even if you feel it's nothing, it is a lot. So one word, resistance. Please resist. Everything is possible. We have the means. I would like to emphasize the need to uh, be aware of uh, the climate emergency, not only on an intellectual level, but really feel it, understand what it means. And once you feel it in your gut, you have to act. You don't have any choice. And this, so, so you can act on yourself, but also uh, on anything. And said the conversion crises of biodiversity loss, climate change, air pollution, and even all the wars that are, are happening around the world, fundamentally they're caused by oppressive power structures, which we all have the responsibility to tackle. But we need to be strategic. So building action networks, building organizations joining forces for collective impact and engaging communities is extremely, extremely important to have a strategy and really to step out of our comfort zone in order to change the system that is in place. Merci à toutes et tous. Thank you very much to all of you, to those who were able to follow our discussions uh, in spite of the technical uh, difficulties and I would like to say as a civil servant a s civil society is very important and it is very present in different negotiations for example the negotiations on biodiversity there was a, a meeting here not that long ago in March and the the building was full of, of people in the representatives of communities who are very active on the ground and who lobby uh, uh, in the government. It is time to bring this meeting to an end, but I would like to encourage you to continue the discussions bilaterally. Thank you.